In what moment did you realize your life would never be the same? I was 14, no friends. Each day I dragged myself home to where I lived with my schizophrenic mother, just the two of us. I would be in trouble for something, I lived in a perpetual state of confusion as I often couldn't remember what she told me I had done. She told me I was stupid and needed to go to a special school because I didn't know what I had done wrong. In the past she had often slapped me until my nose bled and beat me with the metal pole of a fly swatter, but that stopped the summer before high school. She told me she didn't love me repeatedly for months, according to her I was a horrible daughter. Her friends from church had stopped coming weekly to yell at me and slap me senseless as well. I knew when she sent me away with my aunt and uncle the summer that had passed she had read my diary, where I detailed all the abuse and talked about wanting to die. She denied reading it, but it stopped the physical abuse so now it was just verbal and believe it or not that hurt just as bad. I was unlovable and alone. She didn't work and depended on government assistance. She just sat at home chain smoking and playing cards. During the week I woke myself up, made breakfast, went to school. She complained about the smell of eggs in the morning and of course I was useless. I had a hard time socializing and she decided she didn't like the friends I'd managed to make the previous year, so put me in a very small private Christian high school the church paid for. As a low-income, single-parent house I was a freak among higher-income two-parent families, so I spent my days an outsider and bullied at school and then came home to be bullied some more. I got in trouble once because someone told her I walked around with my head down and never smiled. I remember trying out and making the school play that year. I was so proud. My mother decided to use that as leverage for her every whim. If I did anything wrong, sang doing dishes, she threatened to not allow me to be in the play. It got so bad I just quit the play rather than have it continually be held over my head as a threat. A school counselor regularly made me talk to him. I refused to give anything up. He persisted. He asked me if I was abused. As she was no longer hitting me I said no. I had no words to explain the verbal abuse. Being stupid and unlovable didn't seem to qualify. Then one magical day a girl at school approached me and we became friends. A few weeks later she asked me if I could spend the weekend at her house. Her house was beautiful and she lived with her parents and siblings and it was loud, noisy and chaotic. On the Saturday of this weekend sleepover, my new friend had to take piano lessons so I was to hang out in her room until she got back. I was surprised when both her parents wanted to speak with me while she was gone. They informed me that the school had asked them to be my foster parents and presented me with a contract. They gave me 30 minutes to decide if I wanted to live with them. I was 14 years old. I had no friends. My mother was the only family I had ever known. I knew I was stupid. I knew that I was worthless and unlovable. 30 minutes was a ridiculous amount of time for a decision that would change the course of my life that I was too young to make. I didn't know these people at all but a voice in my head screamed at me to do it, with everything it had. So I took that leap of faith. I jumped off the cliff away from everything I'd ever known. Why did you move out from your friend's apartment? I, 22F, live with my best friend and ex-girlfriend, 22FS. X and I are friendly and living together has been emotionally tolling but doable. My current lease ends in August. I asked a few guy friends of mine if they'd be interested in taking me in as their third roommate for the next lease period. They agreed and we toured some spots around town. Last week I held a party at the current house and there were people who knew the hosts but didn't know each other. The boys who I was meant to move in with got to the party and immediately start saying the party next door is full of fat f's and ugly beaches, among a few very disgusting things. Didn't even say hi, just walked in and started saying a bunch of very rude and wrong things about our neighbors. I was embarrassed because they're my friends and I had people I invited that did not know them. I called them out and said something along the lines of that's enough, you're being an asshole, etc. They proceeded to continue making misogynistic jokes and call me a liberal for the remainder of their time there. The next day I went over to their house and told them I would be living with my ex and best friend instead. They got upset at me saying that we were about to sign the lease and now they have to find an affordable place for just the two of them. I told them I didn't feel comfortable living with guys who are very nice and respectful one on one, but proceed to become edgy beta males when surrounded by other men. I told them it seemed like I never knew them and that it showed me a side of them I didn't want to live with. Now they're absolutely ballistic about this. They're telling our mutual friends that I definitely am a snowflake, and can't handle a few jokes. I want to point out that a dark joke in good taste at the right moment is hilarious, but there's a difference between dark humor and just straight up being an asshole to people. My friends are split over this. Some say I shouldn't have left them out to dry after saying we would sign a lease together for the past month, and the other half understand why I did what I did. Am I the a-hole for backing out of this lease over how they acted at my party? I slept with another woman on a break and now my wife has changed. My wife and I both 40 have been together for 15 years. The past 3 years were turbulent and we fought all the time until about a year ago when we decided we needed a time apart or separate. We chose the first option. The first period we went no contact at all but then we started texting then meeting for lunch etc. Dates. We talked about the problems. I felt miserable without her and I hoped she did too because I missed her every day. The problems that we always fought about, the mundane stuff were so trivial now, and we talked about how our issues were really non-issues. She said she loved and missed me so much and I felt so much relief that she felt the same way so I confessed that I was miserable without her and how our problems were nothing compared to not being with her. We made a plan to reconcile and a month ago she moved back home. Before we separated we discussed what we are allowed to do during our separation. 
She said that she didn't want to sleep with others but that I was free to do it because we will be legit separated and she doesn't have a right to decide over me while we aren't a couple. I slept twice with a colleague of mine. It wasn't good and I regretted it so I ended it. It basically wasn't worth it. When my wife moved back she asked me if I did something. She didn't. I told her the truth and she was silent for a while and then said that it was fair enough and not cheating because we already discussed the possibility. Since we have talked about it she has been distant. She says that she is happy and that she missed home and I too missed her and I haven't been this happy but I don't know. When I ask her she says she's fine and not to worry. But I don't know. I have caught her crying a few times but she says it is the news and the world's condition. My wife is wild in bed and I usually don't need to do much to put her in the mood. Now she doesn't react to my touch and sometimes we try for a long time but she says she can't and starts crying. I don't know how to solve this. I don't know if I'm imagining things but even a hug or a kiss I fell her going rigid in my arms but she insists it's nothing and just that she isn't in the mood or tired. Update. Thank you everyone for listening. I have tried to speak to my wife this evening. I asked her for a walk. She is not fine with what happened. She started crying immediately when I tried talking to her. She said that she didn't know if she ever will forget or forgive. What surprised me is that she seemed to put the blame on herself. She said it was all her fault because she started this whole separation idea and then agreed to me sleeping with others like she tricked me somehow and now she wasn't fine with what she agreed upon. She apologized and said that she knew she was being unfair but that she couldn't help how she felt now. I tried to explain that it wasn't her fault at all but I'm not sure she is convinced because she keeps saying that it was all her fault and that she is being unfair. I don't know what to do. I can't see her broken like this. Update 2. She said that she couldn't do this anymore and she apologized because she believes that it was all her doing because she felt like she tricked me and gave me permission that she then couldn't keep and now everything is ruined because of her and that I had all the reasons to hate her. But I don't hate her. I hate myself very much but I would never hate her. She is the love of my life and I regret everything including the break and the small stupid stuff that made us fight and take that break. She moved into a hotel. We decided to wait about telling our families until after the holidays because our broken hearts are enough we don't need to break their hearts too. I just don't know what to do. Am I the a hole for yelling at my girlfriend to stop effing eating? My, M26, sister, F23, runs a bakery business and she's been struggling lately to keep up with orders because she's been short-staffed. She does a lot of orders for wedding cakes that require custard or marmalade fillings, and I offered to help her out by making these fillings at home and bringing them to her so she has less work to do. Unfortunately, the past four times I've made these fillings, my girlfriend, F24, has literally dipped her fingers into the filling jars and contaminated them because, in her words, she just wanted to try some. I've tried explaining to her that she can't dip her fingers in and contaminate the entire batch, because then I have to remake it. I said she should use a spoon and take some out if she wants to try so bad, but she just pouts and says that she likes using her fingers because it takes her back to her childhood. Today, I was trying to finish some chocolate custard to send it over to my sister really fast because she was running late on a wedding cake order for an important client. I told my girlfriend beforehand to not eat the custard, and if she really wanted to, to please use a spoon. I get out of the shower, and what do I see? She has her fingers in it again. I totally lost it because this is the fifth time she blatantly disregarded what I said, and I yelled at her and told her to stop effing eating the food I'm making, because it's not for her and she's contaminating it. She started crying and got mad at me for fat shaming her, even though I made no comment on her weight and she has no history of weight issues or eating disorders. I know I was harsh, but she kept pushing my limits. Am I the a-hole? Fiancé left me due to my cancer diagnosis. I left her destitute. This has been four years ago, so the sting is gone and my revenge has been had. Sorry, if this isn't the right forum. We dated for four years and had what I thought was a great relationship. We were both well-established professionals who both owned homes in the same neighborhood and both with daughters in the home. Her daughter was 11, and mine was 16 when we met. We had actually planned to get married, build a house, and raise the two together. We planned the house build because she had recently been diagnosed with a neurological disease that would eventually put her in a wheelchair, and need something Ada-friendly. During the planning stages, I began doing landscape and construction projects on her home to increase the resale value. All in, I invested roughly $30,000 USD into the home, running everything through my side construction business for tax, permitting, and resale purposes. We had a contract that payment would be made upon the sale of the home. I produced invoices for each and every project, but never pushed for payment because of the prior agreement. Fast forward six months, we're looking at property to develop and finalizing drawings on the home when I began feeling ill. I couldn't eat, constantly vomiting and passing blood. I began noticing that my abdomen looked swollen, which was odd because we were both very clean eaters and were in the gym every day. So I went to the doctor and began having tests done. During this time, she began having small cognitive issues, and the stress of her current position was exacerbating her condition, so she took a $20,000 per annum cut in pay along with a lesser position inside the company. 
after a month or so of different tests, and a biopsy, it came back that I had a golf ball sized tumor in my stomach, and would need to begin chemotherapy. So I began chemo and radiation treatments, which made me, expectedly so, extremely ill. She was spending time helping around my place on the weekends and staying over more, to the point that they were both at my home, more than theirs. At this point, I suggested that we go ahead and put one of our houses on the market, and move in together until the new house was built. I have great supplemental insurance as well as a long-term illness plan, so using that coupled with the sale of one of our houses would push us through comfortably, and help ease the financial stress on her. Shortly after this discussion, she became extremely distant, her daughter wasn't coming down and hanging out with mine anymore, she had excuses for not getting together, she quit driving me to treatments and stopped staying over, she then dropped a bomb, a sentence that will forever be burned into my psyche, I love you, but I can't see myself taking care of someone this sick in the long term, and I don't think we should see each other any longer. In, a text, it broke me, I won't lie, this was the first woman I had ever opened up to and planned a life with since my wife died when my children were one and three, however, I tried to be mature about it, I forced myself to understand her position and to accept what I could not change, I calmly, the next day, gathered all of her things, packed them neatly, loaded them in my truck, and took them to her house to leave on the back porch while she was at work, in order to avoid any awkward exchanges. Walking around the back and under the porch cover, I sat down a box, and saw her in her back living room, on the couch having intercourse with a man that she had introduced to me as a lifelong friend. I had dinner and drinks with this man and his girlfriend, we had gone on vacation with them, as well, I never spoke of the incident with her, and simply sent her a text later, explaining that I would leave her things on my side porch to pick up at her convenience. I discovered 8 or 9 months later from his now ex-girlfriend, that they had broken up due to him confessing that he had been sleeping with my SO, dating back to about the time we were finishing drawings on the new home. Now I'm pissed, revenge time, at this point, I had finished chemo and radiation for the time being and was feeling healthier. I was going through some much neglected paperwork when I ran across the file that contained $32,680 in unpaid, long overdue invoices, which were promptly sent to my attorney to begin lien proceedings on the home. It turns out that I couldn't have done this a moment too soon because she was set to put her house on the market. Coupled with interest over the course of, what was then, 19 months overdue, the invoices were hefty. That, along with the agreement of settling them when the house was sold and attorney fees, left her with roughly $10,000 after the sale of the home and settling her current mortgage. She promptly had to back out of the purchase of another home and moved in with her oldest daughter, Syl, and two grandchildren. She also had to leave her job and begin receiving disability. I ran into her a little over a year ago, and she looked as if she had aged 20 years, and was in the wheelchair we had talked about. We chatted cordially but briefly and I excused myself and went on with my day. A few days later, her younger daughter called me and spoke of my running into her mom, and could we hang out sometime. I gave a vague answer, thanked her for calling in again, went on with my day. The ex then called me a week or so later, and began apologizing for leaving me as she did. Again, cordial but short, I thanked her for calling and hung up. She began texting and this went on for several weeks until once she asked if I could ever see us rekindling what we had, to which I replied, I can't see myself taking care of someone so sick in the long term. Remember the box on your back porch? Did you think that, lifelong friend, brought that over to you from my house? Good luck to you, goodbye. My grandmother got revenge on an entire church twice even after she passed. My grandmother was a member of a large conservative Bible-believing church for her entire adult life. This church, which I'll call Big White Church, was a member of a large evangelical denomination. Big. White. Church was located in a prosperous suburb of a large city in the Bible Belt of the deep south of the USA. Grandma was very active in Big White Church. She worked in the nursery every Sunday morning, helped cook hundreds of church fellowship breakfasts and dinners, accompanied her children and grandchildren on dozens of church retreats and choir tours, taught youth Bible study on Sunday nights and was very active in supporting home missions, as well as helping with other youth programs. She always tithed, and often gave extra for missions and special offerings. Grandma's greatest talent was making other people feel important. I've seen this firsthand many times. Although I belong to a different church, I often visited with Grandma, and when I did, I usually went to big white church functions with her. I've seen her single-handedly cook breakfast for dozens of big white church youth, a task which took over two hours, even in the church's large kitchen. Then, after the meal, she asked the group for a round of applause for the high school student leader for, doing such a great job of organizing the prayer breakfast. I remember that, on a big white church youth retreat at a rural church camp, she drove most of the night to go back to the city and retrieve a big box of evangelistic materials, that one of the assistant pastors, whom I'll call as pastor, had forgotten and asked her to get, in time for our morning program the next day. His boss, the senior pastor, I'll call him pompous pastor, never found out that as pastor had screwed up or that grandma had fixed it for him. As, pastor never even thanked grandma, even though I was a child, this bothered me so much that I asked her about it, she said that she didn't mind at all. She told me her reward would be that those materials, would help children find Jesus. Grandma's service to her church ended abruptly at the age of 73, when she broke her back in a car accident. Afterwards, for the last 10 years of her life, she was homebound and could not go to church because of this injury and declining health due to old age. Her mind was just as sharp as ever, and her faith remained sincere, but her body wore out a little more every day. 
During those 10 years, she made many efforts to reach out to her church, its leadership and her church friends, inviting them to visit her at her home, etc., without success. Every one of these invitations was declined or simply ignored. Near the end, when she was in home hospice care, she decided to plan her own funeral. She and my grandpa called her church and asked for the senior pastor, pompous pastor, whom she had known for over 30 years, to visit her so that they could plan her memorial service, which she and grandpa wanted to be held at the church. Pompous. Pastor was too busy, but asked pastor stopped by a few days later. According to my grandpa, here's what happened at that meeting, with my grandma literally on her deathbed. Grandma, grandpa and asked pastor discussed her funeral for a couple of minutes. Then asked pastor started pressuring her to, lay up your treasure in heaven by, remembering your church and your will. Grandpa told him firmly that, this is neither the time nor the place to discuss her will. They went back to discussing the funeral for a few minutes, then asked pastor steer the conversation back to grandma's will, with liberal injections of how badly her church needed her support. Grandpa told him several times that it was inappropriate to talk to grandma about her will or the church's financial needs, because she was terminally ill and in an enormous amount of physical pain. S. Pastor would agree and briefly talk about the funeral, but would then go back to talking about the church's financial needs, heavenly rewards, where your treasure is your heart will be also, Matthew 6 21, Luke 12 34, etc. My grandma started crying. To put this into context, grandma was more than a steel magnolia, she was titanium coated with diamond wrapped in Kevlar, she rarely ever cried, and never ever cried about herself. Not one tear when the doctor told her that her back was broken so badly that she would never walk again, nor during the following six months in futile rehab. She would shed sincere but well-managed tears at funerals and while visiting family members in the hospital when they received bad news. She would cry to console others, weep with those who weep, but nobody, not grandpa, not her daughter, my mom, nor any of my uncles or grandma's siblings, ever remembered her crying for herself. My grandma was sobbing uncontrollably. Grandpa, a retired steelworker, former Marine sergeant and Korean war combat veteran, physically grabbed ass pastor and escorted him out of their house, not too gently. Contrary to everyone's expectations, grandma lived another six months, mostly because of sheer force of will. Eventually, though, grandma passed away and we held her memorial service at the funeral home, not big white church, pompous, pastor and ass pastor were conspicuously absent. In fact, there were no professional Christians, from big white church, at the service at all, not even in the audience. To start the service, grandpa stood up at the podium in front of the crowd and said, some of you may have heard that I disinvited pompous pastor and ass pastor from this funeral service. This service is not an appropriate place for me to give you my reasons for doing this, although you all know me and so you know that my reasons are good ones. Also, my wife asked me to exclude them. This funeral service may be different from other funerals that you have attended. It is going to be an open microphone funeral. Everyone who wants to say something is invited to come up here and describe your friendship with my wife, tell a story about her that is worth remembering, or anything else that you want to say that will honor her memory and bring comfort to everyone here today. I have asked several family members to prepare statements, but you don't have to have anything prepared. Please, if you want to say something, come up here and do so. There were about a hundred people at the funeral service, at least a third of them eventually stepped up to the microphone. The service, which we had planned to last about 30 minutes, lasted for over two hours and, as best I can tell, not one person left early. There was laughing, crying and hugging, three of her grandchildren played some of her favorite songs on the piano and guitar, we all joined hands and sang her favorite hymns. Afterwards, dozens of people told my grandpa that it was one of the most comforting and uplifting funerals they had ever attended. More than a few remarked that, funerals are better without preachers anyway, or something similar. Remembering her pastors and her church and her will, the one-two punch a couple of weeks later, it was time to start distributing the bequests in grandma's will. Although grandma and grandpa dearly loved each other, they had separate wills because, she told my mom, that makes it easier for us to respect each other's turf, and because their lawyer had recommended it. Nobody thought that my grandparents were wealthy. They had lived in the same small but charming house in a prosperous, well-maintained suburban neighborhood for the past 50 plus years, and had worked hard and lived modestly. But it was rumored that they had a very nice nest egg. Of course, there is no legal requirement for anyone to attend the reading of the will, or to even have a reading. Modern telecommunications and near-universal literacy have made this quaint custom practically extinct, but the reading of the will was a tradition in our family because it was one of those events that gave our close-knit, extended family an excuse to get together. We never had family reunions, they were too difficult to schedule for our large family. But we got together at birthdays, holidays, funerals, baptisms, etc., so that if you attended several of these, you would see just about every one of your cousins, aunts, uncles, and even great aunts and uncles who were grandmas and grandpas' siblings and in-laws. With this family tradition in mind, many of our family members' wills often contained very personal bequests of items that had little cash value, but were the departed family members' way of telling their loved ones that they wanted to share a cherished memory with them one last time. As an added incentive to attend, the family rumor mill had been buzzing with speculation, encouraged by grandpa, that grandma's will contain some surprises. The reading was held in a conference room at a lawyer's office. Unsurprisingly, the attendees included my mom, as well as aunts, uncles, great aunts, great uncles and many of the grandchildren. We were all surprised, 
however, to see Pompa's pastor and ask pastor from Big White Church. They informed us that Grandma's lawyer had told them that Grandma's will a bequest not only for Big White Church, but also for them personally. Maybe it was just our imagination, but my siblings, cousins and I couldn't help noticing that these preachers appeared to be actively salivating over their good fortune at Grandma's generosity. Grandma had a large family, so a sizable number of beneficiaries were named in her will. The lawyer's conference room was a bit smaller than an average middle-class living room. Extra chairs had been brought in, every seat was filled and people were standing in every remaining space. There was barely space for all of us. Grandma's lawyer suggested that Pompa's pastor and ass pastor sit in chairs which were in the front of the room, next to himself. Since there was a large table in the room, this meant that the lawyer and these two preachers were the only ones who were directly facing everyone else. Although the preachers were gratified to be physically next to the center of attention, they did not notice, as all of the rest of us quickly noticed, that these seats made it easy for everyone else in the room to watch them closely, and practically impossible for them to leave the pack to more than overflowing room before the entire meeting was over, because they were farthest from the room's single door, and there were almost two dozen people standing or sitting between them and their only path to escape. The bequests were quite generous, but pretty much what we had expected. Grandpa kept their house, its contents, their retirement accounts and everything that remained after all of the bequests had been satisfied. Children, grandchildren and several local charities received nice, but not extravagant, amounts of money. Several sentimental items were named and given to various friends and relatives. Grandpa was first beneficiary listed in the will. But, after him, all of the other bequests were arranged in order of increasing worth. They started with sentimental items, which had very small cash value. Then each grandchild received several thousand dollars. Then each son, daughter, brother, sister, niece and nephew received a little more. Then several local non-profits received very nice amounts, etc. Bequest to Big White Church, Pompous Pastor and As Pastor were, almost, the last ones listed in the will. They listened politely to the other bequests, but with steadily growing anticipation, as they noticed the exponential upward trend in Grandma's largesse. When Grandma's lawyer got to the Big White Church and preacher's part of the will, he said, This is a bit unusual, but before I announce these bequests to Big White Church, Pompous Pastor and As Pastor, M's, Grandma's name, requested that I read the following statement to everyone present. He opened a letter that was written in Grandma's own handwriting. Find out the crazy conclusion in part 2 posted now. My grandmother got revenge on an entire church twice even after she passed part 2. For the past 10 years, not one person from Big White Church has ever called me, come to visit me or sent me a note to tell me that they cared about me. Not one minister, not one deacon, not one of the church women, not one of the church members who I worked with for all of those years, loved dearly and thought were my friends. I worked very hard for you when you needed me, for many, many years. But when I needed you in your church, you all pretended that I didn't exist. I only got one visit. When I was dying and I invited Pompa's pastor to come to my house and help me plan my funeral. This was my last attempt, after many attempts that I had made over the past 10 years, to reach out to my church and pastor, whom I still loved dearly even though they had made it clear that they did not love me. If only I could have my funeral at my church, maybe some of my church friends, whom I had not seen in a decade, would come to the service to see me one last time. And I know they love to hear Pompa's pastor preach, so if he preached at my funeral, maybe they would come to my funeral to hear him even if they would not have come to see me. But Pompa's pastor couldn't find the time to visit me, or even call me to tell me whether or not he was willing to preach at my funeral. Ass, pastor came by my house, but he didn't want to talk about my funeral. He just wanted me to, remember his church and my will. That's all, just, remember his church and my will. It was then that I realized that I had allowed my church to break my heart for one last time. But that was the last time, the very last time. Ass, pastor did not know it when he visited me, but grandpa and I had already prepared my will, long before his visit, which did include a double tithe, 20%, of my entire estate, for what was now my former, former, church. Big, white, church. This amount was, named the amount, an enormous poop load of money, generating muffled wows from many of her heirs, including me. But I got to feeling badly that we had not personally remembered such nice people as pompous pastor and as pastor. So I changed my will to include them by name. While I was at it, I changed the amount of money that I left to big white church to match all of the love that they have showed to me during the last 10 years of my life, when I was suffering and lonely, and no longer able to work my ass off for them, for free, like I had done for almost half a century. That is her entire written statement, the lawyer said. Now let's get back to the bequests in the will. Bequest to ass pastor, one cent. Bequest to pompous pastor, one cent. Bequest to big white church, one cent. The pompous pastor and ass pastor sat there looking like someone had just injected a gallon of Novocaine into their jaws. Every one of grandma's family and friends felt an overwhelming urge to laugh out loud. But we kept quiet because we knew grandma. We knew she wasn't finished yet. Grandma was simply setting them up for a one-two punch. The best was yet to come, and we didn't want to miss it. There is one last bequest, the lawyer continued, for a charity called, which he named and I'll call Black Charity, then he paused before naming the amount. Most of us had no idea what Black Charity was. But, by the looks on their faces, we could tell that Pompa's pastor and ass pastor knew Black Charity very well. Their faces displayed the same expressions of shock, dread and horror that they would have if the lawyer had said, this bequest goes to the demonic baby eaters to buy extra large rotisserie barbecue grills and tons of charcoal.
Every eye in the room was now fixated on Pompa's pastor and ass pastor. The lawyer, who happened to be my uncle, one of grandma's and grandpa's sons, let the silence continue a few seconds more. If we had been able to read Pompa's pastors and ass pastors' minds, we would have known the history behind the looks on their faces. Black, Charity was sponsored by a large black church just a few miles from Big White Church. They ran a free food-slash-clothing bank, assistance programs for foster children, home delivery of pre-cooked meals for homebound seniors, legal aid, and other social services. A long time ago, Big White Church, which was, and still is 100% Caucasian, had provided a few years of financial and other support to Black, Charity. Then there was a very bitter, acrimonious breakup, allegedly because Black Charity was practicing the social gospel, while Big White Church was preaching the true gospel. Big. White. Church even sued to try to get some of their money back, although the suit was eventually settled and very little money actually changed hands. But, this being the Deep South, everyone knew the real reason why Big White Church, or any white church, would stop supporting a black charity, though Zen were getting uppity and not staying in their place. Grandma and Grandpa had seriously considered leaving Big White Church at that time, but they had reasoned that it was better to stay there and teach tolerance by their words and example. They knew they would never persuade everyone, but maybe they could reach some of the youth at their white church and break the generational cycle of racism. Grandma used to tell us, my church is my mission field. We did not learn the true depth of her statement until after she died. Since then, Grandma and Grandpa had secretly sent a portion of their tithe to black charity every month. Most of Grandma's family, including me, didn't find out about any of this until after the meeting had ended. But Pompa's pastor and ass pastor obviously understood what Grandma, by her actions which are more powerful than words, was saying to them. If you had grown up as a white person in the Deep South, as Grandma, Grandpa, Pompa's pastor and ass pastor had, you would understand. To many white Southerners, this was one of the most personally insulting things you could do to them. It simultaneously labeled them as racists, condemned their bigotry and crushed their delusions of white superiority by saying, these black human beings, whom you hate, disrespect and have mistreated, are better people than you are. So they deserve my money more than you do. Having allowed time for everyone to observe pompous pastor and ass pastor while they thought about how their white church had treated this black charity, and how they and their church had treated our grandma. The lawyer said, the amount is. Then he named the exact same amount that grandma had named in her handwritten letter, the huge amount of money that would have gone to big white church if she had not changed her will. She hated me and made me think I was an idiot. In high school, 10 plus years ago, I was quiet and attentive in class. Teachers liked me. I wasn't popular, but I had good friends. I say all this to explain that high school was relatively calm for me. I played sports, was on the student newspaper, and got decent grades. However, that all changed my second semester junior year. I've always been a voracious reader. My freshman English teacher recommended I move up to the honors English track, so I did for freshman, sophomore, and the first half of junior year. Then I was put into classical literature my second semester junior year. I've always loved Greek and Roman stories, and had already read your typical high school classical reading list on my own. I didn't mind reading them again until I met Ms. Umbridge. She put on a sweet facade, but she was downright evil. She also decided she hated me. I still do not know why, or what transgression I committed, but she hated me. I assume it was my habit of sometimes nodding off in classes. At the time, I had undiagnosed thyroid issues, and was getting up at 5 a.m. for swim practice. I say sometimes, because it happened maybe twice a month total between all eight classes. I don't remember nodding off in her class, but it could have happened. Anyways, her class was 50% essays slash written reports. The rest were random quizzes and a couple tests. I was on the student newspaper, and I was a decent writer. I wasn't worried about maintaining a B or up. We wrote our first paper, and I got a D. I was shocked. The only class I struggled in was chemistry and still my lowest assignment grade was a C after class. I asked Ms. Umbridge what I did wrong because her notes were minimal. She told me my assessment of the material was uninspired. Okay, can you direct me to an example of an inspired assessment? Come back during study hall. Thinking she'd have some example materials for me to review, I got a pass to see her during study hall. Nope. She spent the full hour basically telling me I was an idiot. I remember leaving and crying, because she didn't tell me anything constructive. My friend, the eventual valedictorian, offered to help me on my next paper. My friend and I spent hours on my next paper. She never got below an A on anything. I got another D. My friend was furious. She took it to her AP English teacher and asked him to review it. She said she was entering a writing competition and wanted advice. He said it was great. Her typical A plus work. My friend, quicker on the uptake, asked me for a copy of my original assignment. She asked her AP English teacher to look it over too, and he said she should enter the first one. This one was still good. He'd probably give it an A, but the other paper was better. My friend was convinced Ms. Umbridge was treating me unfairly for some reason, and she must not like me. My friend wanted me to tell my parents or my school counselor. A teacher didn't like me? That had never happened. Sure they didn't all love me, but none had actively disliked me. I decided I'd try one more time, but this time get Ms. Umbridge to help me. Despite the previous horrors of spending study hall with Ms. Umbridge, I went to her office during study hall three times before the next paper was due. She reviewed the paper, and gave me tips on revising it each time. She did this in red pen. I took notes. By the time the next paper was due, I had three revised versions with her notes in red ink on each one. I got a D+. She smirked and congratulated me on my improvement. Beach. I was done. 
My friend was right. This beach had it out for me and was giving me poop grades on purpose. I'm a laid back person, but I was pissed. Never before been this pissed. I took my paper to my newspaper teacher. Sure he didn't teach English, but our student paper constantly won awards because of his work. I told him I was having trouble in English, and could he please look over my paper and give me advice. He was a little confused as to why I didn't ask my English teacher, but he did it. He also told me it was great, but gave me a few minor changes to make. I asked him if he thought it was a B or better. He said he'd give it an A, not 100%, but a solid A. I went to my friend, and we brainstormed. I couldn't request a drop slash ad. This wasn't college. You just don't switch classes at my high school, unless the teacher recommends an honor placement. That's not true said my friend. The football and basketball guys get moved to easier classes all the time to keep their grades up, so they are eligible for games. The athletics director was a friend of my dad, so I requested a meeting with him and my swim coach after school one day. I told them I was in danger of losing my eligibility to swim, because I was pulling a D in a class. I wanted to move classes, but I knew I'd need approval from administration which I wouldn't get without a good reason. They asked if I had requested help. I explained I had asked for help from multiple people, but my grade wasn't improving. I didn't know what to do. They asked to see my papers. I sat while they read them. They both looked at me confused. Neither of them could understand how those papers were worth only a D. The student VP was brought in. He asked who helped me. I explained my friend. He knew who she was, again future valedictorian, and she had even asked her AP English teacher to look it over for advice. I had also asked my newspaper teacher to help me. Student VP asked if I had ever actually asked my teacher for help. I smiled and handed him the three revised versions of paper number three with Ms. Umbridge's red ink all over them. He frowned. AP English teacher and my newspaper teacher were pulled into the meeting. They were each asked to grade the papers. All three papers got an A or better. While this was going on, my dad was called in by the athletics director. My dad was pissed. He demanded I be moved to another class, and that Ms. Umbridge be put under review. Clearly, She wasn't grading students on their work but on her own personal opinions. The school administration obviously bristled at the accusation that a teacher was treating students unfairly. A lot of arguing that I wasn't allowed to sit on occurred in the VP's office. I could hear plenty of yelling as six adult men argued over the appropriate next steps. It was decided that myself, my dad, VP, and athletics director would have a meeting with Ms. Umbridge. The following morning before school we all met. Ms. Umbridge seemed to think she was going to get to tell everyone why I was so stupid. VP explained that if I maintained a D in her class, I would lose my extracurricular eligibility, and we were all meeting to discuss what to do. She smirked and said I should be moved to the non-honors English track, and I had no business being in honors English. I didn't have the aptitude to understand the complex classical literature they were studying, and I probably would need a tutor to even get through basic English. I've never seen my father so red, and I half expected to see steam come out of his ears. VP asked why she didn't try to help me improve. She said it was up to students to put in the initiative to get better. VP asked if that meant I had never asked her for help. She said I had not. VP then pulled out the three revised versions of paper number three and handed them to Ms. Umbridge. Now it was her turn to be read. She called me a liar and said those notes weren't hers. Things got heated, and I was asked to leave again. I sat outside the office. This time the secretary was there, and we both heard the shouting. School was set to start in 30 minutes, and they were all just shouting. Then AP English teacher and newspaper teacher were called in again. More shouting. About five minutes to the start of classes, the teachers left and I was called back in. If looks could destroy lonely, I'd have died then and there when Ms. Umbridge walked out of VP's office. I was being moved to basic English effective immediately. My current grade would not carry over. I would not need to make up any past assignments, and new teacher would be instructed to grade me only on the assignments going forward. My new English teacher, Ms. Honey, ended up being the English department head. She was at least 65 and had been doing this for decades. After 2.5 years of honors English, this class was easier than PE. I barely had to try to get an A, but I refused to let Ms. Honey think Ms. Umbridge had been right. I tried harder in that class than any other class that semester. I finished projects so quickly that I was asked to tutor a girl struggling in the class. I spent half the class period just helping this girl understand the material. I helped her go from a C to a B+. I got something like 104% in the class. At the end of the semester, Ms. Honey called me into her office during study hall. She was recommending I return to honors English for senior year. I must have looked panicked, because she assured me Ms. Umbridge would not be my teacher. In fact, she would not be anyone's teacher. She was leaving at the end of the school year. Ms. Umbridge was only in her late 20s and unmarried. Too early to retire. And my high school was in one of the best paying school districts in the state. I knew what leaving meant, but Ms. Honey still explained that I was put in her class on purpose. The school administration trusted Ms. Honey to determine the truth of Ms. Umbridge's claim that I was basically a lying idiot. Ms. Honey stated I very clearly belonged in honors English. She apologized if her class had not been challenging enough for me. I cried. I mean full on ugly, snot cried. I didn't realize it, but part of me had actually believed Ms. Umbridge up until that moment. Ms. Honey hugged me and consoled me. I spent senior year in honors English and spent my study hall tutoring Ms. Honey's struggling students. To this day, I think about that awful woman fairly regularly. My career is strongly writing-based, and I still worry obsessively over my writing. I hope she never taught again, because she wreaked havoc on my self-confidence. My mother refuses to give me back my nine-month-old son. As stated in the title my mother is outright refusing to give me back my son. To keep it short she offered to watching him for a few days while I was sorting out a move across states. FL to TX, the move came around sooner than expected and all hell broke loose.
It's been a nightmare since my pregnancy but I digress, I'm not currently in FL, I'm in TX sorting things out, my husband is down in FL though so I had asked him to pick up our son from my mom's. For more than one reason, one being my mom is a narcissist and she had been calling me with really concerning behavior, she then refused to hand him to my husband, reasons being we are making a mistake, don't take him from me, you're horrible parents, I do not want my son to be there. The cops were called and they informed us that they couldn't do anything because it wasn't their department so they couldn't just grab my son and hand him over. Is that really it? What can I do to get my son back if the cops won't do anything? They told me we could take it up with family court but we will 1. Not be able to afford that and 2. Not be able to stay in FL for a case to begin with. My son only 9 months old, I really don't want to have to put him through that. Is there any other possible way to proceed? I have goodish news. My son is back home. I landed in Florida at around 12 a.m. I wanted to go straight to my mother's house and grab my son but many advised against it so I waited anxiously till later in the day. Before getting there she called me on the phone. I tried to get her to message me instead but she refused and talked over me. She informed me that she was going to give me my son but to not be too happy. She said she is going to call the courts on Monday to tell them that my son was going to be unsafe. She is hard set on believing something terrible will happen to him in our care, I'm not sure why. When we picked up our son all of his things were ready, as I requested it so I was glad. One of my sisters was recording. I am thankful she was because you can clearly hear my stepfather hurl insults and threats at us in the background. The whole time my family kept giving us dirty looks. My middle sister even threw some of the items at my husband. We left quickly after that, very little words exchanged. My family soon messaged me after trying to make me feel bad for making my mother cry. They sure weren't worried when I was crying over my son practically being held hostage. I'm trying to prepare myself for a possible CPS visit. All stuff is packed away in boxes so I'm not sure if that's okay or how it'll work out. By the time we got home it was too late to call the sheriff's office so I'll be calling in the morning to file a restraining order against my mother and stepfather. My husband also wants to sue them for essentially kidnapping our son but we're still in the process of dealing with everything else. I'd like to thank everyone who gave me advice on how to deal with the situation and all the good wishes were greatly appreciated. It really helped me keep a leveled head. A few things I should have probably mentioned in my original post, we're people of color. I feel like you'll be able to understand what I mean. My parents also don't speak English very well. My husband is biologically and legally my son's father. My mother has zero custody of my son and neither does my stepfather. These were common things that got brought up in the comments so I just wanted to clarify. We still have six days left in FL. A lot of things could happen in that time period. My mother has no evidence whatsoever to back her claims though so I'm not extremely worried just nervous. I wish I could understand what's driving her to act this way but talking to here is near impossible. 15 years ago my, then 18F, best friend, 18F, got pregnant by my boyfriend, 20M, of 3 years and my family knew about it but didn't tell me so I ran from home. Now we are back in contact after 15 years and my, 33F, mom, 59F, demands I mend my relationship with the XBF and XBFF. When I was 18 and in my senior year of high school I really believed my life was on a good track. I lived with 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 my parents and four siblings, 23M, 22M, 20F, 14F, and spent most of my days hanging out with my best friend Ashley, 18F, and or my boyfriend of three years Kyle, 20M. Both Ashley's and Kyle's parents were best friends with my parent, so I knew both of them since we were in diapers. We spent holidays together, birthdays and visited each other all the time as we lived in the same town. Ashley's been my friend for 18 years and she truly was the person I trusted with everything. Sometimes our parents would joke that we are connected by the hip as we were together all the time. I've been dating Kyle for the last three years. I believed he was the love of my life and the one I would eventually marry. We were quite serious and even talked about getting married after he finished college. He was a sophomore at that point. Although I had every plan on going to university, I was quite content with the idea of being married to Kyle and being a stay-at-home mom. My parents loved Kyle and supported our relationship. I really was happy. I think I should note here that my sister 20F was also dating Kyle's brother 23M and that all our siblings were very close. One day, at the beginning of the school year, I noticed that Ashley was being very melancholic and detached. After a while of prodding, she told me she was pregnant. I was very surprised because I didn't know she and her boyfriend broke up a while ago and I didn't know she had anyone else like that in her life. I asked her who the father was and she didn't want to talk about it, but in a way implied that the ex was the father. She was absolutely distraught, so I dropped the topic and just consoled her. I was with her when she told her family and while her parents were disappointed, they promised to support her in whatever she decides. They tried to make her share the dad's name but she refused and made me promise to stay quiet, they did not know she had a boyfriend at one point. I was there for her for the next 9 months. I went with her for an ultrasound, doc's appointments. I was there for her when she was bullied in school for being pregnant, I helped her set up the nursery, I was there when she was sick or just felt down. I held a baby shower for her, went shopping with her, I even took some parenting classes with her. We chose names together and she even asked me to be with her in the delivery room. I noticed that the pregnancy was really taking a toll on her emotionally and physically and I tried to support her in every way possible. She was my best friend, always there for me and I loved her. Some two weeks before her due date I went to the mall to run some errands and ran into her ex. Although I promised never to contact her, the knowledge of my friend's emotional state sent me into a fit of anger and I confronted him. I gave him a piece of my mind, told him what a piece of shit he was for leaving his ex pregnant and alone and not caring for his unborn child. 
He was shocked and said that he had no idea what I was talking about. Ashley never told him about the pregnancy and when I told him she was 9 months pregnant at the time, he said that it was not possible for him to be the father as they broke up over a year ago and had no relations since then. I was confused but apologized for yelling at him in the middle of the mall. After that, he became snarky, said some nasty stuff, and mentioned that maybe I should ask Ashley's friend Kyle if he is the daddy. I didn't really think about his words in any way. Kyle and Ashley have been friends their entire lives, we were always very close, because of our parents' relationship, but they never showed any sign of being anything more. That evening my younger sister, 14F, and I were preparing to have a movie night. I began ranting to her about confronting Ashley's ex and his words. My sister, who is usually very outspoken, got quiet and didn't really respond to anything I said. After a while, she excused herself and went to the bathroom. I decided to go and get some snack and went downstairs to the kitchen and heard younger sister berating my mother. This part of my memory is really fuzzy as I was dealing with lots of emotions. My sister told my mom about me running into Ashley's ex and his words and told my mom she no longer wanted to hide from me the fact that Kyle was Ashley's baby's father. I was shocked, absolutely shocked. I stumbled into the kitchen and demanded an explanation. Both my mom and my sister became white as a sheet when they saw me and my sister started crying her eyes out. My sister explained to me, some things I also learned from other people later, that appear during the end of the summer break Kyle and Ashley attended the same house party, got influenced, and slept together. Ashley got pregnant and told Kyle but they were both ashamed and afraid of telling me. They also didn't share this with their parents. Ashley however couldn't keep the secret and told her mom and dad, who told Kyle's parents and later to mine as well. This all happened when Ashley was in her first trimester. By her second trimester all of my siblings, Kyle's and Ashley's siblings knew about this. Everyone, except for me. I simply cannot explain the way I felt. I was physically ill for the next three days and I couldn't speak to anyone. My parents were apologetic but explained that they didn't want to see me hurt or ruin everyone's relationship. I did not speak with Kyle or Ashley, although they bombarded my phone with messages and calls and also came to my house, I refused to see them. At one point Kyle's mom came to our house and my mom allowed her into my room. While I was lying in my bed still ill and just emotionally drained from the betrayal she tried to convince me to forgive them and how Ashley and the baby need me. I said nothing. Two weeks later Ashley went into labor. I learned from my parents that she had a hard delivery, she lost a lot of blood and needed an emergency C-section. Kyle apparently was at the birth. I was distraught, inconsolable. Because of the betrayal by both, because I planned to be there and now physically and emotionally couldn't, because I was looking forward to this moment for months. So many reasons. My older sister immediately went to the hospital to be with her boyfriend. My other siblings weren't at home, so I was left alone with my parents. All I wanted was to lay in my bed or cuddle in my bed with my mom and cry all my feelings out. My mom received a call from Ashley's mom. She came to my room and told me that she and dad were going to the hospital. I can was perplexed and asked her to stay with me. She said that Ashley's parents need all the support they can get and that we will discuss everything later. I tried to tell her not to go and that I also need their support, but she said not to be selfish and they left. I was left alone at the house and I just couldn't comprehend what happened in the last few weeks. I couldn't believe that my parent would go and support someone who hurt me so much, while I was also here suffering. Am I really selfish to think like that? Check out part 2 now. After 18 years of marriage, I just found out that my children aren't mine. My wife Kelly and I have known each other for over 20 years and have been married for 18 years. We have 17-year-old twins, a boy and a girl, and I found out that they aren't mine two days ago. My kids were got those ancestry tests for the family and we found out that I am not their father. Kelly and I met each other as co-workers at a job right out of college. We both were very ambitious, so after working for a couple of years, we decided to start our own business. We fell in love, and a year after starting out business, we got married. A couple of months into marriage, we had a massive fight over the direction we wanted to take our business in, and I left our home. She came to me a couple of weeks later, and we compromised. We've been inseparable ever since. Kelly got pregnant around that time. We've been through thick and thin, our business has been through several hardships but we weathered them together. We were always there for each other, we could always depend on each other. I loved her so much. She was a part of me and I couldn't even imagine a life without her. I trusted her absolutely until this happened. Kelly has been crying and apologizing constantly. She told me that during the time we had that fight at the start of our marriage, she got influenced one night and slept with a random guy, and that she has not cheated on me since. The betrayal has left me disoriented. I told Kelly I needed time to process this and I'm currently staying at a hotel. I don't know what I'm even doing anymore, the last two days have been a blur. I feel like a zombie, completely unable to feel or process anything. I don't intend to abandon my kids, I might not be their father, but I'm still their dad and I love them dearly. Right now, I'm sitting on my hotel bed and I have not eaten anything today. My thoughts are a mess, so I'm writing this down to help me process. Kelly has always been a great wife and an excellent business partner. I don't know if I'll be able to look at her the same again or if I'll be the same person again. I don't know how to move forward. The day after my post, I called my children and told them I love them. They were scared that I might leave them. I told them that they're still my children even though I'm not their biological father and that I won't be abandoning them. I just needed to think about my relationship with their mother. I saw several comments telling me that they're not my children because they don't have my DNA, but it matters very little to me. I raised them and they're my children. I spent thinking about how to move forward with Kelly after that. I was angry that she hid the fact that she slept with someone else after we got married. 
I calmed down and really thought about the whole situation. I really wanted to call my lawyer to talk about separation but I kept thinking about our life together, so I decided to talk to Kelly and give her a chance. I called her and went back home the next day. My kids were thrilled to see me and we spent some time together. Kelly and I went up to our room after that. I didn't speak to her properly since we saw the results. I gave her time to talk. Kelly told me that it had never even occurred to her that the kids couldn't be mine. She told me that when we had the fight early in our marriage, she was angry at me leaving over a business dispute and after waiting for me to return, she went to a bar one day and got wasted. She picked up some guy and didn't remember much that happened that night. The guy was gone before she woke up the next day and she felt extremely guilty after that. She wanted to tell me but was afraid that I would leave her. To be fair, I was a hot-headed and stubborn guy back then, so I probably would have filed for a divorce without a second thought. To her, it was influence and a mistake that would never come out, so she didn't want to risk our marriage, and I would have never found out about it if she didn't get pregnant that night. She broke down multiple times and apologized constantly throughout the conversation. I believe her story. Kelly has been my rock and partner throughout my life and I wouldn't be where I am today without her. We trusted each other absolutely. This ordeal has made a massive dent in my belief in her as a wife, but I still trust her as a partner. We had long conversations about our future and I told her I was willing to give us a chance. I made it clear that we might not succeed and I might leave, but I was willing to try. I assured my children that no matter what happened with my marriage, I would always love them and be their father. We decided to give marriage counseling a try. My wife asked a therapist friend of hers and she recommended a counselor. We have appointments starting next week. I painted something that shouldn't exist. I felt it. Before I saw it, I studied painting at the School of the Arts in Ishtar. I was in my fourth year and trained beneath a well-known artist whose identity will remain concealed for their privacy. I thought I had some sort of talent that I could depict things that were better left undepicted. Those parts of you that you don't talk about and never will. His words, not mine. I didn't believe him, but I appreciated the interest nonetheless, given the fact that to everyone else, I might as well have been invisible. I wasn't creative and couldn't come up with an original idea to save my life, but there was something wrong with my dreams. They were always nightmares, every single time. When I was a teenager, a therapist convinced me to start recording them, but I didn't like to write, so I painted them instead, and that's all I ever did. Even after I told my instructor, his interest only grew. He always was a bit odd and seemed to think that I was in tune with something else, something beyond the sky, beyond the stars, beyond everything that we could physically touch. Before all of this started, he offered to guide me on a psychedelic journey, as he put it, to try and better understand my condition. The thought of taking anything always terrified me, even more than the nightmares. The thought of no longer being in control of my surroundings and the things that I saw, but unlike in a dream, this world could harm me. This world could kill me. But I didn't like to think I was a coward, so I agreed. That was my first mistake. I don't actually remember that night. He only told me that beyond a certain point, I seemed to lose contact with the world. I laid perfectly still on the ground, and I didn't say a word. I wouldn't respond to anything he asked, or did. I just wasn't there. After the trip had ended, he told me that I left and that I swore I was fine. Though I didn't respond when he asked me what I had seen. For me, all I remember was waking up in my bed, back at home, feeling like I hadn't slept in a year. My skull pounded with the worst headache I ever experienced, like my brain was being squeezed in a vice. And when I got up and looked in the bathroom mirror, I saw tears of blood dry on my cheeks. I immediately thought that something was horribly wrong and I started thinking about all the terrible diseases that it called Vabin. Yet, at the same time, I also knew that I was a hypochondriac. I almost went into debt from all the useless visits to emergency rooms that I had in my past. And it was never anything real. It was just my brain playing tricks on me. So, I talked myself down, and even though I had every right to be concerned, I brushed it aside and assumed that it was nothing. I came up with convoluted scenarios in my mind. That pilve somehow led to the symptoms, I felt, always trying to rationalize it. It wasn't sickness, it wasn't magic, it was psychology, and I would find a way through it, just like every other time. It seems so stupid when I look back at it now. The next morning, I was taking the train to school, minding my business in the second last car, in one of those backward facing seats, because I determined that to be the safest possible way of sitting on a train. If you sat in a regular seat, you'd be thrown forward if the train came to a sudden stop, and if you were in the very last car, you risk being rear-ended. Sorry if I fall off track. I'm not in the best state of mind right now. Anyway, I was sitting in the back, looking out the window as the world rushed away from me, 
eyes on the glass skyscrapers that sliced up across the clear blue sky. There weren't many people around me, just students trying to get a half hour of sleep before class, or cramming in some last minute studying. I still felt so tired from whatever had happened over the weekend. Not a regular kind of fatigue, but a dissociation where I didn't feel like I was entirely situated within my own body. Then, it stopped. A cold sweat began to cling to my skin, and a sensation of absolute dread intensified within me. I felt like I was in danger. I looked around me, completely alert, but nothing caught my attention. My heart beat hammering in my ears. I glanced out the window, and that's when I saw it. It was so odd, that I didn't really know what I was seeing, at first. There was a middle-aged man, black peacoat and blue jeans, standing on the roof of a building below the tracks, the slanted shingles beneath his boots staring directly at me as the train passed him by. There was no reason for him to be there. He wasn't dressed like a worker of any sort, and this wasn't a roof that was meant to be accessed. He looked like anybody you would see on the street, but for some reason, he was there, and he was looking up at me his face blank and expressionless. The train passed by him so quickly that I almost thought I was hallucinating, and I tried to look back, but the roof was out of sight. I glanced at the other passengers, but nobody else seemed to notice, even the few people that were staring out the window, and should be rightly seen him. Once again, I rationalized it. I was an overly cautious person, prone to overthinking things, and I knew it. So, I brushed it off. I was sleep deprived. I was unwell. I was recovering from a psychedelic experience that I didn't even remember. So, I just saw something that wasn't there. Easy. Only there was still the feeling. It wasn't going away. I felt like I was flooded with adrenaline. Like I was inherently unsafe and I was sweating so much that my clothes were starting to stick to my skin. So, I looked outside again, watching the city pass me by, and tried to find something. Something that didn't belong. Something out of place. Everything was normal, but it didn't feel normal. When I reached my stop, I stepped out into the hot daylight, along with everyone else, and made my way to class. The feeling didn't let up for even a moment, and I found myself looking over my shoulder every chance I had. I made it to class, but I don't remember much. People were talking, and I was working, but I was just going through the motions. My mind wasn't there. I was looking around at everyone, trying to find something that didn't fit. But everything was exactly the way I remembered it. Until I tried to look up. There was a sealed ventilation shaft on the ceiling, just an empty darkness behind the slats. But it caught my attention like a magnet. It didn't feel empty. I couldn't explain it. But it felt like something was in there. Like something was watching me. It felt like I was in danger. So, I got up, and excused myself. I left that class as quick as I could and stepped out into the daylight again. People were walking all around me, down the open paths of the school, and I felt like every single one of them was staring at me. I could never actually catch them doing it, but I just got this sensation that at any moment, somebody could come out of nowhere and stick a knife in my throat, put a gun to my head, drag me off into the bushes. It was the feeling of being watched, not just by anyone, but by something that means you harm. Like you're a prey animal grazing in a field, and suddenly, every primal switch in your body flips at once, and tells you to run. I happened to look up at a tall administrative building. It was used to house the offices of all the professors. Through one of the windows, maybe on the 16th floor, I could see a woman standing perfectly still, staring down at me. She was dressed like she belonged in an office, like she belonged in that setting but she didn't. I waited for what felt like minutes, and watched as people passed behind her, but they never acknowledged her existence. She just stood there, and held my gaze for as long as I could bear it. I looked away. I needed to go home. I needed to get away from there. I picked up the pace, and walked back to the station, and all the way. My eyes caught on anybody who lingered just a moment too long. They would look back at me confused, or turn away to do something else. They were never it, whatever it was. Whatever it was that was watching me, stalking me. I got on the train, which was now packed full of people, though I managed to find a seat near a window. I wanted to be able to see it. The train started moving, and I kept my eyes peeled on the horizon of endless skyscrapers as they rushed by me, looking down at any rooftops that waited beneath the tracks. I could still feel it. I knew that it was watching me. And then I saw it. We passed near a bridge of glass and metal that joined to shopping centers. 
and upon the swooping arches of steel that were fastened above it, an old man in rags stood in silence, his tattered fabrics hanging from his slender frame in defiance of the wind. He watched me expressionless, his eyes shifting with the movement of the train. I nudged the lady who was sitting next to me and pointed at the man outside. Do you see a man right there? I asked. On the bridge, standing on top of it, she looked out the window, and then back at me, her expression alarmed. She shook her head, and then got up from her seat, moving to the back of the car. I looked again, searching the landscape for the next appearance as the train began to slow for a stop at the next station. On a restaurant balcony, on the street below the tracks, a young tattooed woman sat at a table with two men, but they didn't acknowledge her presence. She was staring up at me, her mouth hanging slack, as though caught in a depraved, hungering trance. I got the attention of a father entertaining his son, and pointed out the window. Hey, do you see that lady down there? I asked, right at the table with two guys, with the tattoos. The man glanced out the window, looking down at where I was pointing. I see the two guys, he said with a shrug, returning his attention to his kid. The woman slipped out of view as the train pulled into the next station. Was I losing my mind? Did something happen to me? My instructor wouldn't be on campus until the next day but I had to speak with him. He had to know something. I did have his number, so I swore that I would call him as soon as I got home. Nobody could see this thing but me that much was clear but that didn't mean that it wasn't real. The thought occurred to me that I could still be hallucinating from the effects of the psilocybin, or that I could even still be laying in my instructor's living room. Maybe I didn't remember the trip because this was it. Only, this felt real. This felt concrete like I could reach out and touch this thing. I eventually made my way home, keeping clear of any crowds, and training my eyes on every building I passed. Though I never saw it, I knew that it was there, but there were so many possibilities that it was almost down to sheer luck whether I found it or not. Walking out front, I heard the sound of laughter and clinking dishes, and saw that the neighbors across the street were having a small party on the bottom floor of their building. Most of them were seated at a table, visible from their window. But my blood ran cold when I saw a young, plain-looking woman staring directly at me. She was seated closest to where I stood, and nobody seemed to interact with her, or acknowledge her existence in any way. I assumed that her chair was real, but to the rest, was empty. Others were standing. Every other seat was occupied. Perhaps they avoided it, but didn't quite know why. It didn't occur to them. Maybe this creature did exist, and filled a physical space within the world but for some reason, could only be seen by the victim of its malevolence. The only thing that I truly realized in that moment, was that every single time I saw it, it was getting closer. I quickly entered my building, and made my way up to my apartment. The feeling stalked me, even when I was in the halls, or fire escape, with no possible way of being observed. If it had no line of sight within the world, it was almost like it watched me through the walls. Like it crawled through all those cracks and spaces invisible to the naked eye, peering up at me from the subtle gap in the baseboard, or the darkness beneath the radiator. I had arrived at my apartment, but I didn't feel safe. I felt exactly the same. I checked every room and every corner, every closet that I barely opened, and found nothing. But I had to be sure. Then, I opened the blinds, and peered out at the building across the street. I could still hear the party on the lower level, but my eyes weren't on them. They were on the man in the black suit who stared at me from the apartment opposite to my own. I shut my blinds, hyperventilating where I stood. I was too terrified to leave, so I didn't. I retreated to my bedroom which was thankfully absent of any windows, and shut the door behind me. I made sure my closet was wide open, and dismantled the frame of my bed so that nothing could fit underneath. I only needed a mattress anyway, assuming that I could even sleep. I called my instructor, and tried to ask him what was happening, but he didn't know. He seemed to think that something was trying to contact me, and that the apprehension I felt may have just been a primal fear of the unknown. But I don't believe him. I know fear, and this is unlike anything I've ever felt before. It's relentless. It's my mind telling me to stay away. I could feel it watching me, even while I cried in the corner of my room, but I don't know how. There's nowhere it could have been, but it felt like it was everywhere like it occupied every fleeting shadow. I looked at a picture of my family, on my nightstand, and saw a person that I didn't recognize. I picked up the frame photograph, and saw a bearded man standing behind my father, staring back at me. I took a picture, and sent it to my mother, asking who he was, 
but she said that she didn't see him. At some point, I called her and tried explaining, but I was too scared and incoherent to get anything across. She thought I was having some sort of psychotic break from the drugs I took, but I know that I'm not. This is real. I know it is. She called the police, and I know she was just trying to do what she thought was right, but that wasn't what I wanted. If the police came, they would take me outside. And outside is exactly where it was, where I hoped that it was. I don't know how long I waited there. Time isn't something that I have the greatest grasp on, right now. It must have been night, because underneath the door, there was only darkness. Everything was quiet so quiet that I could hear my own heartbeat. I remember wondering why the police didn't come, but I was so tired and confused and scared that I didn't know what to think. Slowly, I crawled to my feet and made my way to the bedroom door. Every second felt like an eternity. My vision blurring the closer I drew, like the entire world was caught in slow motion. I put my hand to the knob and felt the cold steel against my fingertips. Every hair on my body standing on end as a horrible chill ran down my spine. My teeth began to chatter and every muscle started to twitch with an ancient, primordial fear that crept in from the back of my mind. Then, I turned the knob and pushed the door open with a long, agonizing creak that cut through the silence like a knife. The darkness of the hall spanned before me, the air cold and still. At the end, a tall man stood in the shadows, his expression as empty as a mask, wordless. He stared into my soul, and I could barely even process what I was looking at or how much danger I was in. I didn't have anywhere to run. There was nowhere to hide. I called to him, but he didn't respond. Slowly, I crept closer, my footsteps creaking upon the floorboards in the dead of night. It was like I was hypnotized, yet at the same time, I had to know. I had to know if this was real. The closer I got, the taller he seemed to become, every feature distending and looming, while my heart hammered in my ears and tears of blood stained my cheeks. Every pore on my body dripped with an icy sweat, and I could feel urine trickling down my leg as I stared into his dark and soulless eyes. His face started to change, roiling and shifting, like I was looking at a thousand people at once, transforming between male and female, young and old, human and animal, to something altogether different. And the closer I drew to that truth, the more its mouth seemed to stretch, splitting open into a yawning darkness of teeth and fear that I swore, went on forever. And then, I was gone. The next thing I saw was a light, gleaming overhead through the blur of my vision. My ears were ringing, but I could hear the murmur of people nearby. I was laying on my back on a hospital bed, and my head was pounding with the worst headache I had ever felt. They had put me on something some sort of sedative and it wasn't long before I fell back asleep, whether I wanted to or not. All that I dreamt about was that man, cornering me in until I wanted nothing more than to die, until his jaws unhinged into a shadow so deep that even the memory of light disappeared forever. I could feel the cold slickness of his throat, the teeth as they cut into my mind, and ground my soul into a tattered pulp. I could feel the horrible agony of every single moment, until I finally realized what it wanted. I woke up, at some point, but I don't recall much. I said whatever I had to say to get out of there, anything to get back home again. I remember taking the canvas out of storage, and getting every paint that I had. I remember mixing them, churning them with my own blood and vomit and every bodily fluid that I could, until my palette contained the most vile shades that my mind could comprehend. I remember my hands moving across the canvas. I didn't need a brush, only my flesh, smearing and writhing as though caught in some unearthly trance. It wasn't in my head anymore. It's in front of me. I can feel it watching me. I can feel it, cutting through my thoughts. It's eating me, and I can barely move. I shouldn't have done this. This shouldn't exist. I just want to die.